if you are in it for the long run, I believe that that open source is what can gain you a, a um, loyal, I don't know whether that's the right word, but, but a, a following of people who, who, who trust that you're going to do the right thing. And now in the case of MariaDB, we've gone to extremes or let me say Monty, who, who uh, created both the corporation and the foundation, went to extremes by by separating these two, two aspects and giving one entity the task to earn money and the other entity uh, the task to uh, guarantee the open source-ness of the project, uh, uh, guarantee both licensing-wise and, and, and process-wise that the uh, the project of the software is being governed in a way that that is aligned with the expectation. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to another hacking open source business podcast. I am one of your hosts, Matt Yakovit, once again joined by co-host Avi Press. And today we're really excited to have Kai Arno from the MariaDB Foundation. Kai, how are you doing? Hello, I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me here. So Kai, how's the weather there? Uh, warm for being Munich and, and uh, uh, February. So it's over 10 and I don't know what it, how much that is in, in the local units that you happen to use in New York. <laughs> ah, yes, always difficult when we do translations. 50 for... degrees Fahrenheit for our U.S. folks. <laughs> Look at that. Avi, Avi has it on the tip of his tongue. He, he did the calculation for us. That's always great. So, Kai, we wanted to start with some rapid fire questions and get them out of the way um, to get things rolling. And so this is something that we've started doing recently at the beginning. We used to do it at the end, but we found that in the beginning, it gets the energy flowing. So we decided to start with these questions. And the first one that is going to make you scratch your head is, what was the first Linux distribution that you ever installed? Slackware. Hey, I, that was mine too. <laughs> that was mine too. Yes. Oh, uh, the good old days of Slackware. Um, so nowadays, um, you know, you're probably not running Slackware. I'm guessing. No. Right. Uh, but you are probably running several different pieces of open source software. What is your favorite go-to piece of open source software outside of Maria, outside of MariaDB, what, what, what is the favorite tool in the open source space right now? So I don't know what really qualifies in, in sort of your definition set, but favorite piece of software, and it is open source, is Python. Oh, <laughs> lovely. Lovely. So you're, you're, you're doing a lot of hacking on Python now, huh? Well, yes. I, uh, I was for so long. Well, first off, I started as a, uh, as a program, and I didn't use, use Python. I used the last one I really was developing a lot with, with was, I, I know this sounds weird, but it was Delphi. And then I moved into management doing less and less programming and uh, ended up doing no programming. And I also swapped operating systems to, to use, use Mac OS. So I couldn't use the, the usual ones that I had been using on Windows. And then, then I realized that the human being, which has grown up as a developer for mental sanity, needs to do some, some programming. And Python was the right one for that because it's so beautiful and sleek and it, it sort of keeps me sane. Fair enough, fair enough. And what are what what editor are you using when you're writing anything in Python? Well, <laughs> now you go into uh, the so somewhat uh, the unhappy uh, area. So I'm actually going now to do uh, using more and more Visual Studio. I was impressed by that. Um, I went through a, a a period where I was using TextMate or something, anything that was uh, was line based, and, and I realized that yes, Visual Studio is is a good one. It, it really increases my productivity because if I if you do hacking very seldom, then learning a new IDE will take time away from the the mental sanity aspect of actually doing the fun thing, which is coding. It's not fun to learn a, a new or a different editor and go to the next place where the next bug is. No, it's not. But Visual Studio Code has, has, has been a good thing for me. Oh, well, that, that's cool. And, you know, back in the day when you started, what, what was your first job in tech? 
I was with the IBM Finland library. My father used to work for, for IBM since 1950s, and, and uh, I followed that. And then I had I wanted as a teenager to have a summer job. Well, I don't know whether it qualifies to be in tech to to be the the, the, the boy that runs with the various uh, new new manuals that come for for mainframes and putting them in the right place. But, I felt I was in tech, so yes. I'd count that. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yes. Um, we all have those, those those first interesting jobs. My, mine was I was a – I was a scanning imager technician where I had to like scan documents for an insurance company. So that was my. Yeah, well, that was tech. Yes, it was. That was tech. It was. It was. It was a piece of technology, the scanner, right? So it, it must be. Um, now, Kai, as you've gone through your career at MySQL at MariaDB, um, you know, over the last twenty years, is there a company that you've looked to and admired? whether it's in the open source space or not, as a company that you wanted to emulate or bring some of the business practices from? That's a really tough one. That's one where I don't have uh, uh, anything bubbling up in my, my, my head. I, I think they've, they've changed over the years. So, so I, I would bring up uh, Microsoft as an example of something that was somewhat of an object of hatred or fear. I don't know which one at certain points in time, and then turning around a lot. So, so if, if I want to single out a company, that would probably be, be, be it. I don't know whether it really answers okay. your question. But. No, no, that's totally fine. There is no right or wrong answer for these. It's more about like, you know, hearing what, what, you, what, what is in your head. Um, speaking of what's in your head, what is the last book you read? I keep reading several books, and now I'm reading one... Uh, by Hans Gumbrecht, which is about uh, Germany after 1945, or actually 1948, when the guy was, was born. And, and uh, I think that's something that, that helps us understand the world that we live in today, because the, the hangover that Germany was, was having then is, is probably similar to hangovers happening somewhat more to the east very soon. Uh, indeed. Um, what about like? Is there a business book that you recommend people should read? Uh, so there's one which is very old that I do recommend. And that is writing winning business proposal by I forgot his name. So there's 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 like one book that that explains how to structure the process of document writing so that you can actually land a deal of some kind. And I don't think that's a, mm. that's a very good one too. If, if I take okay. one in English, probably going to need to have a look at that one myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Kai, if we, if we're going to meet up at a conference and we're going to go out for food, what is your favorite food? It is sushi. 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 Okay. Good pick. Okay. I can tell you the first time I ate sushi, I didn't know it was sushi. So I, I was invited. This was way back when uh, uh, in the eighties. And I uh, went to a, a conference. It was about the fourth generation programming language called Focus, and it was in New York. And, and I was a speaker, and it was a speaker's dinner. And I came there, and they had this nice fish kind of thing. And, and, and well, strangely enough, they combined fish and rice, and didn't really get that. But it tasted really, really good, and I had lots of it. And, and, and I had heard about sushi, but I did not know that it was sushi that I had. And I've been... <laughs> Now, Kai, you have given talks at various conferences. You've given keynotes at conferences. And so if they're going to ask you what music to play as you walk up to the stage, what music do you tell them? So I would probably pick something from, from Finland. I mean, you are very right in asking me about am I at home in Finland, that there would be... Uh, yes, I like German music. I decided to become a German. I applied for German citizenship when I heard Carmina Burana by Karl Orff, it's a, it's a 1936 piece of classical music. Uh, but I would pick Sandstorm by Daru. That's Finnish and that's much more modern. And, and uh, I would have to explain less and look cooler. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. All right, you've survived rapid fire questions, Kai. That wasn't so hard, was it? <laughs> <laughs> that was easy question to do it. Well, yeah, that, I mean, the, the questions weren't so bad, right? Right. So, no, not so, <laughs> so, all right. So Kai, you know, um, 
you know, you are CEO over at Maria DB Foundation, um, and you've been CEO for several years now. Yeah. How are things going? 2019. Yeah. Uh, so how are things going? What's new? So what's new? So new is is uh, broadening the landscape of, of sponsors uh, that help us uh, uh, pursue our goal. And our goal is, we always talk about three words. It's, it's adoption, openness, and continuity. And adoption means that we want everybody to use MariaDB wherever it makes sense. And it makes sense if you're doing a, a, a relational uh, database. And openness means that we want uh, people to be able to contribute on, on purely technical grounds to, to our database. And the new thing here, yes, we, last year we, we were ma managed to recruit uh, several people which were really valuable for us. And, and uh, what I also want to underline is that we're broadening the, the spectrum of, of sponsors that, that uh, provide the continuity of, of us pursuing adoption and openness. So that's probably very internally looking, but but if, if if you look at so what's in it for the community, it means that we're shortening the cycle for for contributions. So it means that uh, when when people contribute something to us, they will uh, not have to wait as long as as they have. And when it comes to to, to adoption, we're, we're looking at so many different uh, small pieces here and there that enable MariaDB to be a better choice or a default choice or, or, or satisfying the user needs, needs better. So when you said that you're expanding the, 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 the sponsor base, are you implying that you're just trying to go out and get more sponsors or you're opening up kind of who is eligible to be a sponsor that maybe you were well, turning people away? I, I wouldn't say that we are picking in the sense that only a few companies are eligible. I think that Hmm. Uh, what we're doing is, is we're looking at, at various sectors of the industry or of the open source users for whom it makes sense to uh, sustain our openness and, and, and adoption and all of that. And one of those areas is um, uh, cloud service providers. And then, of course, it's big tech. Not everybody. In the, I mean, big tech has been supporting us from the very beginning with IBM and Microsoft and, and what have you, and in, in, in China with, with uh, Alibaba and, uh, sorry, that, Alibaba and, and Tencent. But, but we're not by no means covered 100% there. And uh, then then a third one would be, sorry about that, I should have. <laughs> That's okay, they really want to get a hold of you. Yeah, they, they do want. Yeah, so, so the, the last one would be uh, governmental initiatives. So initiatives where, where we can uh, uh, ensure the presence of an open source uh, alternative in a, a stack, if, 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 um, if you can call governmental things a, a stack. So like governmental procurement uh, would benefit from, from having open source uh, choices instead of tying themselves to, to, to closed source initiatives. And some of them can support us, us financially. Now, just so listeners are aware, there's a unique relationship because, you know, MariaDB Foundation is different from MariaDB Corporation. And, you know, uh, MariaDB Organization is a not-for-profit, but you are funded based on sponsorships. Um, whereas MariaDB Corporation, it's a for-profit business, which is focused on the commercialization aspects of MariaDB. Yes. Okay. And did I miss anything with the nuance there? I think I got it. No, I think the nuances were perfect. Perhaps you could uh, you would you you, you would uh, then ask what's the relationship and are they one of our sponsors? So yes, they are one of our sponsors, and we uh, the the level of their sponsorship is is. Big, it's huge if you count the number of contributions. If you count the numbers of, of euros or dollars or currency units, their share is, 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 is smaller. And we openly declare this on, on mariadb.org slash finance mm -hmm. so they can see that, that, that they, a couple of years, they have been our biggest uh, sponsor, but, but it's by no means uh, uh, the lion's share or anything on their side. So, Kai, this puts you in a unique relationship with a lot of your sponsor companies and a lot of the other um, organizations that you work with, because 
you have different people with maybe different ideals and different goals for where to take MariaDB. How do you navigate potentially conflicting, you know, um, ideas or priorities from your sponsor base? So, so the problem is not as big as you might imagine. So it's um, well, that's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> it, it, it really is a good thing. It, uh, I don't spend my time mediating between these conflicting goals. And one of the reasons is that um, if you look at, I mean, I mentioned already the sponsorship level when it comes to contributions. So, so the code is actually mainly being developed eighty-five uh, percent or more by the corporation. And our attitude to those contributions is the same as to everything else, which is we're happy to take it. It's great. And we really appreciate uh, those contributions. But uh, with, as with any contributions, it is a question of what the sponsor in question wants to, to develop. And uh, if you look at the number of, of uh, um, developers that we have ourselves, uh, it's, it's small in comparison to what the, the contributors have. And uh, on top of it, we, we're uh, mainly not developing stuff much ourselves, but we are um, getting in, we're merging the contributions, we're reviewing them, we're improving upon them, and we're making them into a, into a proper product and, and building releases and all of that. That's what our developers are doing. Yes, we do do some some development, but it's like if, if you are a sponsor and become a sponsor uh, with the reasoning that now you want to use your your wield your power uh, by influencing how the uh, developers at Maria Libby Foundation are using their time, then you will be in for a, a disappointment because there's not much of that time. And uh, on top of it, uh, being a non-profit, we don't link those two. We, we require the sponsors to trust us to make the right thing for the product. So when you are, say, convincing a new, you know, new company to that, that is considering uh, sponsoring the foundation, yeah. um, is there ever a notion? I, I'm sure they may ask. They must ask something like this of like, what's the ROI of the money that we are we are yes. giving to you? Or do they not ask that? Or like, how, I'm well, curious how you sell that to them or how you show that, look, this 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 money is going to X and Y and here's what it does for you. Yeah. So, so yes, people ask that, and some people are more uh, knowledgeable when it comes to open source, and others expect uh, things to happen. Like right? we are the great uh, provider of of hardware, and we now uh, can offer you uh, the opportunity of of letting you optimize your software for our hardware, and 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 then then it, the expectation setting comes into this. Uh, so I, I think this, uh, the question is very, very much spot on. Uh, when we're talking to, to sponsors, the expectation setting has to be that this is about a non-profit organization. The, the value that you get is some something that everyone will get. And look at our initiative from last year. Here is a blog that described what we were doing. Some of the things we couldn't accomplish. And guess what? That was because we had limited resources. We could not do all of the things that we wanted. But with your sponsorship, we might be able to do this, that, and the other thing. And then there is a connection between your sponsorship and what we uh, can, can give uh, the market, the user base, including you. Now, there's a lot of people out there who have somewhat successful open source projects. Maybe they have a lot of downloads. Maybe they've got people who are using it, but they're trying to figure out how to either invest more, make sure that it's sustainable for the long term. When you talk about a not not for profit or a foundation type setup, um, what are some of the, the 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 cautionary tales or downsides you might tell people, and what are some of the things that might actually benefit them if they wanted to go that route of um, making this more of a, a foundation or a uh, not-for-profit um, from an open source perspective. Okay, so 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 I, you're asking the question on behalf of somebody who has an open source project and it's sort of partly business oriented and and partly they want to grow it for the sake of open source. And now, what what would I what kind of advice would I give uh, that that uh, 
that would emphasize, underline the open source aspects of, of, of it. Is that your, your question? Yeah. 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 So, so I think it's about the timeline. So, uh, and it's about about your credibility and your long term um, attitude towards why you want to do open source. So, if, if this is about the quick fix, so that you can close your next financing round. Uh, and, and then increase your valuation and then exit as soon as possible. It might be that you, you shouldn't uh, bother uh, thinking too much about your open source strategy. It looks like you might be interested in, in, in a quick fix and, and just increase your user base. And whether it's open source or not, I, they won't notice anyway. I, I am in a hurry. And, and for those people, I, I don't have much advice because that might be the way to, to, to proceed in certain cases. But um, if you are in it for the long run, I believe that, that open source is what can gain you a, a um, loyal, I don't know whether that's the right word, but, but a, a following of people who, who, who trust that you're going to do the right thing. And now in the case of Maria TV, we've gone to extremes, or let me say Monty, who, who uh, created both the corporation and the foundation went to extremes by by separating these two two aspects and giving one entity the task to earn money and the other entity uh, the task to uh, guarantee the open sourceness of the project uh, uh, guarantee both licensing wise and, and, and process wise that the uh, the project or the software is being governed in a way that that is aligned with the expectation. So, so yeah, that's probably my, my advice. That the longer term you are in, in uh, your focus is about, the more it pays off to to adhere to true open source standards. And the other piece would be to um, to stay logical, to stay true to to uh, some kind of a logic like if if you are there just to earn money quickly then it's probably not going to be an easy thing to explain that you are uh, the most uh, fundamentalist and uh, true open source project ever because people won't believe that you have to sort of keep it uh, realistic and, and, and real and there are several levels to aim at in in how holy you are and how 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 much you adhere to, to open source, but but pick one and, and, and don't set the expectations uh, at the holier level than what you will fulfill. Yeah. So it, are we in a, a weird space though, from an open source perspective where open source is a marketing gimmick or tool seems to be more prevalent, especially with a lot of startups. Um, is that something that you've kind of noticed and do you have any thoughts on, I mean, I've noticed more and more companies claiming openness, um, uh, but not necessarily following the same sort of open source, uh, strategy or values, um, that, uh, many of those in the space have had in the past. Of course, yes, you're completely right. Uh, that, that, that is the case, but uh, I'm, I'm also arguing that there are several ways of, of being loyal to the thought of, of open source. There's not just one recipe. And if there were one recipe, then everybody would, 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 would follow it and it would guarantee both uh, commercial success and a well-used used product. So it's, it's, it's really hard. I mean, if you, if you look at, you were asking me what open source project is, is, is the one that I'm using and, and I'm happy with it. I mentioned Python. I don't think that there's a Python business model and there never was really supposed to be one either. And that's probably a reason why Python is consistently number one in uh, Stack Overflow questions over, over the last uh, last year. So, so it, it probably is a situation where you have to, uh, where you will have an easier time if you get rid of all of the commercial goals and only have an open source goal but then you're not going to build an organization around it either. It's, it's, it's going to be purely managing volunteers. Very good point. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I'm curious then when it comes to 
you know, bi business initiatives um, on the enterprise side of things. Um, mm -hmm. Like, how, w what is the foundation's role in supporting that? Typically, are they um, are are there, are there things that you're very directly like collaborating on and partnering with for? I can give a very short short answer. None. Like ooh. none. We we don't have a role when it comes to commercial initiatives. It's it's it's, mm. it's uh, sort of it is none of our business. Which also means that we don't we don't say it's wrong. It's not like we say, oh, you're earning money, ugly capital. <laughs> ooh, you're not part of our group. No, we're not saying it. It's just not our concern. It is it is something that that you as a sponsor. You have to decide on your own. We don't judge you for that. We don't command commend you for that. We're, we're not there to be uh, saying whether you're if, if you are a commercial entity and a sponsor of ours. We're 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 not judging you and giving you credit or plus points or minus points. It is it is it is your your thing as long as the relationship between you and the Maria Divi Foundation is a clean one and is based uh, on, on on open source. Okay. So, Kai, you mentioned one of the things outside of the commercial side. You, you know, you've made it very clear commercial isn't, isn't part of your focus, but adoption is. So yes, it is. That, means, that means that I need to put on my other hat. Always got to change the hats, right? So I'm going to put on my, my metrics hat, my adoption hat. And, uh, you know, so I've got my metrics going on here. Um, and so, Kai, when we talk about adoption, how do you measure adoption at MariaDB? So, so I'm afraid I will have to give the same answer. I just said none, and then now we say we don't. But, but that, so, so of course, that, that's that, that's a very sort of shorthand answer. Uh, one of the so one way to answer it is uh, we often face this, or sometimes at least face decisions where we have to, uh, uh, where the implication of our decision is: will we? know exactly how many or how few users we have or will we uh, have uh, many users but not be aware of how many they are and and we pick the latter so so measure measurement metrics is not the highest uh, of our goals uh, adoption is and then of course you can say well how do you then know whether you succeeded and you would be right with that that that, that objection. Uh, you would clearly be, be be right about that 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 objection. Uh, but I'm, I'm afraid there's not so much more that can be said. We have indirect measurements of like how many websites are there out there and what's the percentage of them using MariaDB. And then you would uh, have a follow up question saying, well, okay, so MariaDB is used on websites, but but what about other places? And then 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 we come to uh, uh, an area which is much less measurable, like how many MariaDBs are running on uh, Amazon, on, on, on Azure, on, on Google. And I would be really, really interested to know an exact number, but there's no way of getting that. So, so um, you are a super fan of force metrics, but, but, but uh, I'm not able to, to satisfy your, your fandom. But, but you can, you can, because here's the thing. It's not always about these hard counts. A lot of times it's about the things that you look at um, and, and goal as a company organization foundation. So I am sure, Kai, that you have some things that you're looking at doing, whether it's we want to speak at so many events or maybe it's you want to look at website traffic to the MariaDB org properties. Even if it's not a direct adoption, are there there has to be some things that you're oh, yes, there are many such many such things like like uh, DB ranking and, and our oh, yeah. traffic and, and, and all of those there are such such metrics and they are they are indirect and they help us. I also would go a lot with with, with anecdotes like what does my mom's cousin say about Maria DB? If she doesn't know what it is, well. That's a bad measure. That, that's a bad metric. If if she says that she read about it here and there and 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 uh, knows something about what it is, well, then it will probably have a brand recognition that that that, that helps. Yeah, and I think that here's what I found with a lot of uh, projects, and this is not just commercial organizations. This is a lot of projects who struggle with that adoption question, right? Maybe they look at 
repository metrics. So how many code contributions, which are great, you know, or how many things that doesn't necessarily necessarily show the usage growth or the adoption. So they're struggling and they're looking at maybe a group of metrics that directionally point to growth. Right. Yeah. So, so, so one of those measures that, that, that to give you a very serious and hard answer is is looking at Jira and looking at the GitHub. Mm-hmm. So looking at mm-hmm. how those contributions grow and how how they are being dealt with and like votes on, on, on Jira items. That's a way for us to know what people really really wish for. Now, like those stars uh, that, that that come out of those. They they, they absolutely help. And so how are you collecting feedback? Are, are you getting good feedback from the community on a regular basis? Or do you find that your feedback comes from a very small, very vocal um, group of people generally? Well, the latter is often the case. And we're, we're trying to find ways to, to uh, open up, to, to, to really get outside of a bubble so that we don't get the vocal answers, which, which are very, can be very, very skewed. Uh, we publish our uh, contribution statistics and we listen to those who contribute and of course that's also a skewed group but they they have a vested interest and they, they really know uh, that they want to stand behind Maria DB and, and, and that uh, requires us to lend them a bigger voice and also having sponsors is a great thing because these sponsors have ears that we don't so I mentioned sponsors like IBM Microsoft, Tencent, Alibaba, a service now, we ask them, what do they hear? And, and that helps us a lot to, to sort of not get only the most vocal input from the last FOSDEM, which is a favorite conference of ours, and it, it's really fun to be there, and we get a lot of value out of it, but it might, might sometimes not be representative of, of, of new users, for instance. That makes sense. Uh, I guess if, if um, you know, just engagement with the open source project itself is is one of the more um, measurable things. I'm curious what you've seen as to be the most impactful things that you've done to to foster that. And one of the things you mentioned was, you know, like reduce the amount of time it takes to make a contribution. Um, what what kinds of things are you seeing that like get in the way of people contributing? Like how have you unblocked people? Yeah. So so. Um... I think that, that there's this so-called hello nurse answer. Like the first time you get, uh, if, if you have a, a, a medical condition and goes go somewhere and then the first responses are, are meaningless, it really doesn't count as, as it's giving any value. Uh, but the first time you get a meaningful response, that's something we want to, uh, that we have started measuring and are, uh, and are reducing. And then as for the blockers, it is, <clears throat> <clears throat> like inside the foundation itself, we have a number of developers. Who, some of them are better at the optimizer. Some of them are better at you know DB. And uh, there would be like areas of specialization. But the, the code is is so deep that, that there clearly will be areas where we don't know uh, as much as is needed to accept the contribution and even to be properly able to to judge it. Uh, and, and then what we have to do there is to find the people which usually are inside the, the corporation and, and uh, nudge them and to see whether they think this is an interesting thing or, or, or something that needs to be done or not. So, so this is like going into the details of how we actually do our work with the uh, contributor community. Now then there would be, of course, the, the user community. And user sounds much way more simpler than a contributor, but sometimes it can be highly complicated. And one of, one such case happened last year. Uh, one of our biggest uh, users is, is Wikimedia Foundation. They run like Wikipedia and Wikidata and Wikimedia Commons, and all of that run on MariaDB. And they they would be upgrading at uh, certain intervals, and and, and uh, we we have been chatting with them about. Uh, when they would upgrade up to which version. And then, then we got, um, so we don't, we don't have like every quarter a specific meeting, or we at least did not have. Then we got a note from, um, their main MariaDB 
DBA saying that when we were upgrading to 10.6, uh, in the middle of our upgrade process, we got uh, uh, a huge problem because uh, uh, the newer, uh, we had migrated, was it 15 or so, so they were in the early phase of migrating to the DB. They, they, uh, they had uh, upgraded 15 of them, and then when they got a denial of service kind of attack, uh, the uh, servers were hanging. And that was hugely complicated to, to debug, to identify where the bug was. And because it wasn't pro possible to reproduce it. The, the bug as such was not reproducible under a normal load, only when they had some, some level of hacking attack on them. And you, you are hard pressed to find an organization which is more open than Wikimedia Foundation. But not even they can be open when it comes to how hackers hack them because that would simplify the life of the hackers. So this was a long, long process of first identifying the, pro, uh, the bug, uh, then making it reproducible, and then fix it. And the fix was three lines of code, so that was not the issue. It was finding it. it was, and, and, and this is truly about the metrics of, of, of open, um, of, of, uh, not of openness, but, but of adoption. I mean, the number of users... Uh, of Wikipedia is huge, and they're relying on MariaDB, and that's that's a sense of pride for us. And 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 this like this was one of the key uh, experiences of last year. I don't know exactly how it relates to your question about how we uh, create uh, adoption, but though that's an example of something we devoted a lot of energy to last year. Now it's interesting because you bring up that that issue with Wiki specifically. And I know this is something that a lot of projects, um, especially when they're not commercial projects, we're trying for, you know, like an offering around like a support or subscription. Um, when you have those types of issues come in, are there expectations from users um, that you're going to be like jumping right on to help them fix it, even though it's, you know, open source without warranty? And it, does that increase as sponsors get involved with, you know, their bugs or issues? that they're like, you know, oh, well, we need you to jump on this really quick because we're a sponsor. I mean, is, do you get that pressure? Is that something that comes in? And how do you deal with that kind of support expectation? So, so um, as I mentioned, there's hardly a more open source-ish or open organization than, than uh, Wikimedia Foundation. And that also means that they know, so first, so that uh, you would have two sides of it. One, one would be that they expect the product to be open source, and they, they expect that they don't have to be a sponsor and they expect everything to, to sort of be open and GPL and all of that. But the, 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 the positive side of that from when it comes to expectation setting is that they clearly don't expect us to, to, to support. They know that that's something which, uh, where they have no natural right to, for it to happen. But, but we have the urge to help them, and, and they made it easy for us to help them. So I think that was a meeting of the souls where we, where we realized that we have completely aligned the goals, and there was, uh, I would say, complete mutual respect, and never a problem of the nature that you mentioned that they, uh, they, they have too high expectations on us. And, and of course, that's a positive thing for us because if your expectations are low, it's all the easier to to uh, to exceed them. But but they are then the extreme example when it comes to to being very very open and, and, and following the ideals. Then there would be others who who are uh, more wanting to 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 benefit from the open source things, but but not necessarily um, dealing with with uh, contributing contributing to it and. And that's a challenge. And, and usually those organizations are such where there are some people completely getting it and completely understanding it and others not. So they, they, they would uh, work within those organizations to support those who get open source and, and understand its benefits and limitations and help them work with uh, the other parts of the organization where, where they expect pre lunches perhaps. <laughs> I mean, I, th that is a really interesting, um, like, point and scenario, I guess, where, you know, with Wikimedia comes to you and they have a problem, you know, where they're getting 
you know, DDoSed or whatever it might look like. That's a fairly, you know, that, that could happen to other sites. And it's not, you know, uh, it's not necessarily an isolated thing, but, you know, you feel compelled to fix it for them because it's a, you know, a huge stamp of approval for the project that they're relying on and serving, yeah. you know, so many people. But what if they came to you and asked, like, hey, we need help with something that's very specific to us. Um, how do you balance, you know, the fact that this is a really important user for us? Um, but like, you know, our resources are limited and we need yeah, to so, make sure that we're so, helping everyone. It gets tricky fast, I would imagine. Yeah. So, so I think that, that somebody like, like Wikimedia Foundation, they do understand when their needs are uh, aligned with the overall user base and they would understand mm. when their needs are not. So like optimizing uh, the Wikidata database. Yeah, it could be a question of, of, of uh, uh, writing the query optimizer in such a way that it benefits others, or it might be very specific, like it might be a question of, of redesigning their data schemas, their, their, their create statements, in which case it's a consulting case, which is none of our business. And so the good part with some uh, organization like, like like them is that they, they would they would not have unreasonable expectations. Uh, and and uh, there would be others, perhaps, like in the scenario where, uh, as opposed to the Wikimedia Foundation, where everybody in a deciding position understands open source, where would you where, where would find an, an organization where, uh, where some of them understand it and others don't, and we would be in the process of uh, perhaps getting them to be a significant sponsor or not, then it becomes a question of explaining how we work and why we work and what our priorities are and what it means to be a, a non-profit and what, what, what constraints we are bound by. But usually there are in those organizations people who understand things and we just need to make their life. We need to help them and they need to help us. So it's sort of a coach within those organizations. So you're finding that, or I guess, how common is it that people are kind of not understanding? It's uh, very common. Like it's, it's super common, and those would not; uh, those would be the large majority of organizations which are, which just use us and never sponsor us. I mean, let's face it: we have uh, less than twenty sponsors, and there are more than twenty. Like if you look at Fortune 500 companies, if we have twenty sponsors, there's 480 that don't, and most of them are still using MariaDB. So so that's 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 a basic fact, and uh, we cannot just reach them and, and say naughty naughty and you are a bad bad company that that, that don't, just uses and don't support us. That that's not how it works. I think I think we we're well enough served by identifying those who work closely with us and who understand open source and where it's possible to articulate uh, the thing, uh, the, the, the dynamics of, of, of open source. How do we get more companies to realize that the sustainability of the software they rely on is dependent on either sponsoring or, you know, doing something to promote the software and to promote the community? Because, you know, you, the, the comment that you made about like, you know, 20 out of 500, you know, are, are sponsoring, um, that's a problem that is a systemic problem throughout the entire open source community. You know, um, certainly you know, at a certain point, projects kind of reach such ubiquity that it's everywhere and people are contributing, like like you mentioned, Python. Um, I don't think that Python necessarily is in danger of just disappearing overnight because there's so much work going on in that community. But there are a lot of projects um, that aren't at that Python scale that do require some level of effort and a lot of people rely on that software yeah i don't think that there is a, an easy answer for that and i would say but that, why not kai we want easy <laughs> oh, okay so so uh, perhaps a gun point or something now so, uh, <laughs> so you, you, this uh, i think there's a conflict between um business logic and, and ethics. I think this is a very fundamental thing that um, it's very easy to, to talk about the trickle down effect and, and, and explaining the whole concept of capitalism as a, as a functioning thing. But it's also fairly easy to describe 
using the examples that we mentioned, that, that uh, the altruism that is part of open source has no automatic relation to, to how these systems are, are fed. So I think it's, it, it, it's, it's a question which is much bigger than just only open source. I think there, there will always be people who, who want just the benefits, but, but not do their fair, fair share. That's, that's the question of, of society in general. And I, I like, uh, I think one of the reasons why a bit of uh, overrepresentation in open source comes from the Nordic countries is due to the fact that we have a tradition of, of helping in each other and, and, and have a more egalitarian society than, than the rest of Europe and in particular uh, the, the, the US. And perhaps that's not a popular thing to say, but I do think that that this uh, pondering uh, uh, what's right and what's wrong really helps in in, in uh, uh, creating business models that work with open source and and, and also in persuading uh, people to to contribute, be it in uh, a sponsor to a non-profit organization or, or or doing the right thing when it comes to to uh, using services from a commercial provider that is relying on open source. Yeah, that, that, that all makes a ton of sense. Um, I guess uh, maybe one other question is kind of at, at a high level, um, the this kind of interesting setup that uh, Maria DB has with you know the foundation being kind of the steward of the open source with another company commercializing is that something that you would recommend more um, projects and organizations look into or do you think that it was largely out of very unique circumstances to you that made that make sense we've talked with a lot of other companies that have you know donated a project to like you know cncf or you know the asf or these other um these other foundations and so i think the setup that maria db has is, is very very interesting and i'm you know just curious about yeah you know what you think about it kind of so i don't think out. that we are a complete special case i would say that um the larger the user base of a project is, the more you can go for this divided corporation foundation thing. And, and mm -hmm. the smaller the user base of a project, the less likely it makes sense to do open source at all. Like if, <laughs> if you have a very, very niche uh, product and, and it's not competed, then why go open source? I mean, I like open source and I want people to do so, uh, but, but if people ask, me whether it makes commercial sense it probably doesn't uh in, if, if, if the number of users is, is, is very small and and if, if the number of users is big enough to merit uh, an open source project as such it still doesn't merit having the construction be, be separated into two different parts but if, if it's like a huge uh, i can imagine a programming language doing it i can i can remember you know, like if you call sap r3 some kind of a you know, programming language, if you, if you will. And, and, and there I could imagine it working with Python. There's, yeah, the outcome now is that it's purely open source, but I could ima imagine there being a, a Python or a Pandas company that, that, that has a, a larger role than, than, uh, than the average user of, of Python. And with operating systems, obviously that's, that's the case. It turned out differently with with Red Hat, uh, and, and we were talking Slackware at the beginning, it, it's not it's not exactly the same there. You don't have a Red Hat Foundation and a Red Hat company. It's IBM and it's IBM. Uh, but but uh, the world could have worked out in a different way. I don't think that our model is at all unique. And, and the larger your use base, user base is, the more I would recommend you to, to look into such a model. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, we're running a little low on time now. And so I wanted to ask a quick follow-up to one of your rapid fire questions, just okay. out of kind of curiosity and interest. And um, I think I'm someone who, you know, also has a lot less time to write code these days. And I, you know, we'll still find time uh, here and there. Cause I also agree that like kind of keeps me sane from time to time. What are you hacking on when you do find the time to write some code? Are you building stuff from MariaDB? Are you doing random side projects? What do you, what do you build? Well, yes, I suppose you could call it a random side project, but I really like geodata. So whenever uh, I do lots of, of various sports, like running would be the most simple one. And I, uh, whenever I, I run, a new, run a new track, I, I record it. 
I do lots of kayaking, I do lots of skiing, a bit of mountaineering and biking, and all of those I, I, I collect into uh, the, the, the GPX uh, tracks of them. And then there's so much fun you can do with those. You can get statistics, like when we were out kayaking, how long was our break? Like when you plan your next kayaking trip, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have a 15 minute break to eat and then if somebody needs to have a bio break, it's probably five minutes. I can tell you uh, the tiniest, tiny kayaking break for, for the bio purposes is 15 minutes and, <laughs> and, and uh, a very quick lunch break is, uh, is 60 minutes. And I know that based on lots of analysis by Python of these GPS tracks. I can also then compress the tracks and uh, I, I've done uh, maps of all of the places in Finland that are kayak. There's, there's so much fun you can uh, geek around with, with, with geodata. That's super cool. I have an app tracker for, for uh, skiing uh, called Ski Tracks that I love. It was like the best dollar I've ever spent on an app, and it does a lot of the stuff. It's very cool. And, uh, it yeah, was so what really I, very fun was, to I did on that was um, the area in, in, in Finland where I, I uh, kayak, I can show you here, that's the island that I usually start from. It's, it's, uh, I even know it in your measurement units. It's 19 acres big. <laughs> And, and uh, you can start from there and go all of the different <laughs> places. And, and if you do any of the default apps uh, and you paint your tracks, the resolution is lousy. So I, I paid the open source um, maps from, from or, no, I, it's open source, I don't have to pay. So I, I downloaded the high resolution maps from the Finnish government, which are like 8,000 pixels <laughs> times 6,000. And then using these tracks and, and a bit of geometric called transformations, which are non-trivial. I mapped the, the, the kayaking trips onto the pixels of that, so I could draw the kayaking trips in red and the rowing trips in something else, and, and the, the sailing in a yet another color, and color and motorboat in a, in a third color, and so on, which which then makes for a very, very high-resolution map with, with, with your exact tracks. And that's thanks to Python and, and, and open source. Go Python. <laughs> <laughs> See, we, we, even even if we, we might not be in the code every day, there's still little side projects we can all do to keep our, our skills relevant and, and our brains active. Right? Yes, the mental sanity is very important. So, so Kai, where, where are we going to see you in the future? What, what conferences do you have coming up that you're going to be at? So we're looking into conferences where, that our sponsors are, are organizing. So to, to get exposed to the user base, um, okay. we, we were just at, 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 at FOSDEM. There are several ones coming up uh, all across here. I We haven't really yet decided who goes where, so I cannot give you a time and a date. Okay. Except for CloudFest. So there's a, an event called CloudFest. That's the next one. It's it's usually for the uh, cloud service providers. It's at Europa Park, close to Frankfurt in Germany. And there are thousands of, of, of developers there. And they're not our usual bubble. So, so I'm, I'm really excited to see these people and, and how they are uh, using databases in general and how much uh, into validity they are. So that's, that's our next upcoming conference. Awesome. Well, Kai, I hope that we do run into each other soon at another conference um, so we can catch up in person again. Um, yes. Always great to see you. Um, it is. And wanted to thank you for coming on and sharing a little bit about the foundation and uh, some of the things going on. Go Python and Maria. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kai. All right. Until next time, everyone, don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow us and leave any comments.